learn from everyone loves a train wreck story. Like everyone loves it. It's just na human nature to love laughing at something or, you know, seeing somebody tweet something insane. Like you, we can't help it, but you know, we all learn from both the negative and the positive. And I think especially for business people who are most of our writers or entrepreneurs or, you know, business owners that you learn from not only the bad, but then how does the bad get handled? And not only the good, but then how does the good get handled? From cave drawings to family histories to stories around the fire, humans crave order among chaos, connection amid isolation. So we tell stories. Our mission at the Storytellers Network is to bring the art of story to the masses. Whether you're in marketing, you're an entrepreneur, or you're developing your own personal brand, telling your story effectively can make the difference between celebrating milestones and collecting unemployment. The Storytellers Network strives to help storytellers tell their stories so you can learn from the best. Now, your host, the inbound evangelist himself, Dan Moyle. Welcome to the Storytellers Network Podcast. I'm glad that you're joining us today. And in this episode, we talked to a writer that I've been following for a while, I'm a big fan of, of her and her husband's work, uh, her, her partner in crime, just a, a fantastic person. She is a mom, she is a writer, she's a storyteller, she is a podcaster, she is a ton of things, and she's a big fan of Twitter. Uh, her name is Allison Kramer, and she's a co-writer of books like On Marketing, on branding, on selling. Uh, the new one is on branding, which is a great book too. Uh, so check her out. We are so excited to have her today on the show to talk about her storytelling craft, her successes, her stumbles, and in other words, her story. Now, before we get into today's conversation, just a reminder to find us online at thestorytellersnetwork.com for more episodes. Also, how to contact us for other resources and all kinds of help to help you tell your story. If you like what we're doing here, please leave us a review. It helps us to reach new storytellers out there. And if you don't like what we're doing, hey, no worries, walk away, right? <laughs> Change the channel. Uh, anyway, so uh, I want to thank our supporters out there. Thank you to Podcast Pilot and Casterly for supporting this movement so early on. If you want experts on the podcast world, like how to start your very own podcast, talk to the teams over there headed up by the legendary Jamie J and Sarah Parrish. So thank you, Podcast Pilot and Casterly. And also, a personal thanks to my parents, Dick and Sharon Moyle, who uh, have supported me from day one and are supporting me in this as well. Big, big supporters of what I do. I use supporter about six times there, so you know that that means a lot to me. So thanks, mom and dad. There you go. Now, let's get to our stories. So yeah, Allison, thanks for joining me today. I appreciate you having you here today. Thank you for asking. I'm happy to be here. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's a big moment for me. As I said in the, the intro, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan. Uh, I've been listening to the Unpodcast for a while, following both you and Scott. So uh, it's it's cool for me. Um, and, and I know where you, where you are, basically, because we've talked before. But uh, I like to prove that basically storytellers can be anywhere in the world. So where geographically are you? So we live in Oakville, Ontario, in Canada, which is about half an hour outside of Toronto. All right. So yeah. Toronto storytellers. I love it. Absolutely. So when I had reached out to you and I said, you know, here's this podcast. I have an idea. I want to talk to storytellers. Did that kind of surprise you or do you consider yourself a storyteller? No, I definitely consider myself a storyteller. And I think that um, when some of the best lessons that you can share with people, the best way to do it is through stories. So yeah, I would definitely consider myself a storyteller. And obviously you're a writer too. So this season we're talking about writers on, on uh, the Storytellers Network. So you've written books, um, you've co-written with Scott Stratton. Yeah. And so my thought was, man, I'd love to know what it's like to be a co-writer. I mean, obviously as a writer, you, you write what you do, but does it change when you have somebody writing with you? I think, um, I think it does. I think it changes in that um, it's a partnership, right? So it's the same as any time you work on any kind of project, whether it's a book or when we do the podcast together or when we're doing research for a talk that my, Scott is going to give. There's always like, I think partnerships should make you better, right? You should be greater than the sum of your parts. So like this idea that we both have different ideas and and those ideas come together into conversations and that's how we create the content. So we started out with, um, Scott was about halfway through his first book on marketing and that's when I kind of jumped in and I was helping him out and we were working together. And what happened is I would kind of read through what he'd written and then with my own viewpoint of it, sort of ask him questions. And that sort of became, you know, how we would write and how we finished up that book was 
you know, you make your own assumptions when you're writing or, or creating any kind of content. And so it's sometimes it's nice to have someone that you trust and that, you know, you value the, you know, different qualities they bring to the table who can say, Hey, what, but wait, what about this? Or I do not see it that way because your own assumptions can get in the way when you end up giving that book to readers because they don't share those same assumptions. So that's kind of how we started. Um, and I think it makes us better. Uh, we are barely good at working together and our process has certainly developed over the years. Um, we've gotten better and better at it. But I think that anytime you can get feedback from someone who you trust, even if they're not your full co-author, I think it's always great. It's that trusted feedback that makes your work better, I think. Yeah, that's cool. So now you didn't start here, obviously, but where, so where does your story as a storyteller kind of begin? Well, I've been, I've been writing since I was a kid. Like I was always, you know, I was always writing poems and stories from the time I was little. And uh, I do, I love research. I love, uh, I spend a lot of time online and reading different articles and stories. And I always did before too, like in university and high school and stuff, I was always reading, always taking in other people's stories. Um, so I think probably I just kind of am that way, but I also really appreciate in other people's work. Like I really love when I read something, not, not necessarily fiction, obviously, which is storytelling, but if you're reading an article, a news article, or, um, you know, some kind of case study that we get a lot, for example, about business, I love when people put their own story into it and talk about why it affected them and why it touched them. And I think because I react really well to that sort of style. I think probably I wanted to be able to do that as well. I just think people like to know, you know, what happens to you, what it's like, like everybody's, everybody has a different viewpoint. And that's why storytelling is great. Cause you're basically sharing the way you sort of are seeing things. And I like that. I love that you look that you look back as you were always that kid who wrote. I've got a, a photo of me sitting at my parents' table when I was probably like six years old, seven years old, and I got my, my little cowlick up in the back of my head and stuff. And I've got a, an old glass there when I'm and I'm writing with a pencil. And I thought I could have been doing math. Who knows? But I'd like to think I was writing a story. So I love that picture of I've always been a writer and a storyteller. So yeah, I just enjoy it, and I like all the words. Like I, I think that. Um, Scott is brilliant, brilliant, brilliant at, you know, ideas and big ideas and getting big concepts into sort of small amounts of, of space, which is what makes him a great speaker because you have only so much time. Whereas I love like, you know, give me the 60,000 words to explain everything. I could I'd probably write too much, you know, like I need to edit myself back. So I just, I love how much in depth you can get with something, a concept when you're writing it. And, and I, and I love it. So you mentioned writing for speeches. Is that different than writing one of the books with Scott? Like, as you guys so said, write. Is it different? We don't write for speeches. So Scott oh. doesn't, we don't write in terms of like, there's not a script or all these kinds of things. The way the talks work and, you know, I can, from, at least from what I know, from what Scott has shared with me, you know, he is always kind of evolving them. He sees what works with different audiences. He, something will come to him on stage and it'll just be, you know, a different way of looking at something. So hmm. he did, we don't script out. I know a lot of speakers do. Um, but Scott doesn't, it just, he's just gifted at it. It's just a, such a natural talent for him that when he's on stage, he just kind of like comes alive with it. Now he's very well crafted at it. He practices it a lot because it's what he does, mm -hmm. but we don't, uh, we don't script, we don't script them. Oh, okay. And I don't want to turn into the Scott show. This is certainly about you. Um, oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> do, uh, so when you give presentations, is it kind of the same thing for you rather than writing it? Do you just have your, your thought process? Mapped out? I, I think so. I, I don't speak as much as, um, as Scott does about the work that we do. But when I do speak, I, for me, when I get to the end of writing a book, I, I feel like I'm done when I've really explained it. And I feel like it's round and, and makes sense and it all comes together. And I think at that point, I feel really confident in it. Like, I'm not one to overly prepare in some ways. I feel as though if I've written this book, that I've done the research and I've put in the time that you could ask me pretty much anything about the book and I would be able to answer it because I've spent that time doing it. So it's like an expertise kind of a place, right? I mean, our books are about 60,000 words. So once you've researched and spent, you know, a year or whatever, and you've written the words, you know what you're talking about. So I'm not, I think scripting might make me nervous maybe. Um, but yeah, I mostly express myself in uh, not on stage. So, but like the, the podcast, for example, which we do together, we never script that. Like that just, that's just us having a conversation. So I don't think it would present itself really well if I like thought about everything I was going to say before. I prefer to just go and, 
have kind of a natural conversation, natural reaction. Yeah, that's great stuff, Allison. What, so going back to, um, you mentioned a, minute, a little bit ago that you like to take in those words too. What are some of your favorite places to go for those stories? You mentioned articles, um, maybe fiction, but what's one of your favorite places to go for stories? I don't know. That's a tough question. I've, I'm like a big social media junkie. So I'm always reading. I, you know, read the New York Times every morning, but that's more news based than stories. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just like I love social media because it filters out It kind of like makes my friends like that qualifier that I'm going to be interested or I'm going to like something. I love Slate. I love, you know, I just I like the I like news a lot. Like I try and know what's going on in the world. So I guess that would be kind of what I like to read. And then I try and read fiction whenever I can. So it's, I don't always, I'm not always able to with kids and work and everything, but that's sort of what I would do to relax, I guess, if I could. Yeah. And certainly, I mean, news can be done in storytelling format when it's done well, right? Long form journalism or whatever. So I, mean, yeah. I get that. Yeah. What, what is it that you love, Allison, about telling stories in, in particular? Is there one thing or a couple of things? I just think it's the best way that I, I feel like it's the best way to get whatever message you're trying to deliver across. I feel like if it's an honest thing that has, that really you feel and that, you know, especially if it's a situation that's happened to you and you're able to share it, you know it, like you don't have to make it up. It's very authentic because you're just telling something that happened to you or you're telling a story. And I feel like it, people are disarmed by it. They, people don't love being told what to do. They don't love like, okay, we're going to learn a lesson now, or we're going to, figure out how to improve our business now in terms of what we do. So I think just telling a story about an experience that you had, and that's what like we, in the new book that we wrote, it's all these stories, right? And there are case studies, there are personal experiences, there are interviews, but they all have that spin of it of, you know, this is what was Allison or Scott's experience with that. And so I think that that really in some ways disarms people and then they're really open to hear what you have to say. And in a book like Unbranding, when you have a hundred stories, as you said, there's got to be about a million that you either get sent or you have an experience with or whatever. How do you choose which stories of those to tell? So basically we record, we start off with research. So both of us are online addicts. We live online. So we're always reading, right? Always. Mm -hmm. That's really the most hours I put into work are just in reading articles and having, hearing about people's experiences with um, businesses or experiences as entrepreneurs or employees. So I spend a lot of time reading. And then what we do is we go into a studio once a month and we record our podcast. And so the process is for that month, let's say, or three weeks, maybe we're saving stories. We'll see someone like, Oh my gosh, like I have to. And I know if I think in my head, Oh my gosh, I have to show this to Scott. That's, that's a good story. Or I can't believe that happened. And sometimes there are good stories Sometimes they're not good stories. Like we learn from both, right? But they're always a motive. They always, for both of us, we have some reaction to it where we feel like we have to tell the other one that this is happening. So, you know, we keep running lists. We'll email them back and forth to each other. Scott keeps a list on his phone. I'll email them to myself and Scott. So then we have this kind of over the weeks, this collection of stories. And then also the personal things that happen to us. We're like, we got to talk about that. Like that has to happen. And we are lucky because we have a, a great relationship with so many people that people send us stories. So if, if a company's had a really bad day, we're getting like emails, texts, messages, like, did you see this? Did you see this? Did you see this? So we kind of collect all those things over the month. And then usually we're not super into prep, like I said. So usually like the night before, <laughs> um, Scott will go through everything. He'll make sure he has all mine and his, and he'll print out the ones that we feel are kind of the short list for the podcast. So obviously some of the ones we think are amazing, like the first day don't always make it to the end. So it depends on how things go. And then we take those and what we feel are the best of those to give us for usually about a half an hour to 40 minute podcasts. We pick, we take those, the rest of them we save or we trash and then we organize them um, for, for four different episodes. And then we'll record those. And that's great because we have kind of a, um, a saved copy, right, of our conversation of what the article was in a video and audio. And then when it comes to book time, if we, we then I have all of that saved, all of that information. And then so for unbranding, we had, I don't know, probably like 500 of like we had a lot of things. And so then it's a matter of going through and saying, okay, so which were the most emotive, which, which spirit, which stories demonstrate whatever lesson we're trying to get across the best. Right. And then, and then we whittled that down, whittled that down. And then for some of them, we reached out to 
you know, maybe the CEO of the company or a connection to do an interview to further the story. Um, some of them are very visual. So we, you know, reached out to the person who was involved to get permission to use whatever the visual was. And then that sort of is the book. So it's sort of, and that's been the same for all the books, even though they didn't all have a hundred stories, it was the same process. Basically you start off with tons, then the podcast and then the book. And then I would say the very best and the very clearest examples and the ones that we just like can't not tell every single person we know, that is what ends up on stage. Gotcha. So that, you know, so that's kind of the, the process, I guess, of what gets whittled down. Yeah. And so um, you mentioned something that I want to get back to, uh, but I just want to kind of, you know, as we're talking and people are listening, I want to reiterate, we're talking to Allison Kramer of the Unmarketing World, uh, co-author of Unbranding and several other books, a just fantastic writer and storyteller. Allison, you mentioned a little bit ago, learning from both positive experiences and negative. Do you find that you want to find a purposeful mix of like 50, 50 or, you know, scare people with negative of 70% and build them up with 30, you know, cause, cause I, I gotta be honest as, as a fan of Scott's world bag, I love his rants. Um, but I, but I know too that he loves, you both love to tell positive stories. How do you find that mix? Well, so, well, first of all, I think that the mix comes from that we we're very much in have the mindset of consumer advocates. So we try and think about it from the consumer point of view. So when, mm -hmm. when for our work, when a company treats a, a customer really well, that's a great story. And sometimes it's fixing a mistake, like maybe they treated someone badly, but then the way they fixed it was so great. We just have to share that. So that's sort of where that comes from. And then honestly, I'm meticulous about the balance. Like it's, it's, balance in in a book is one of those things that nobody notices unless it's not there and then everyone's like oh like what this book's weird so i am like meticulous about it even about strange things the balance between good and bad stories the balance to make sure that all the lessons we wanted to get across are represented as equally as possible um even length and like things that people who don't write never notice until it's wrong like we wrote a book um I guess it was three books ago now, goodness, uh, called The Book of Business Awesome and The Book of Business Unawesome. And it's a flip book. So you read it from one side, it's a book of business awesome. And then you actually like turn it over, there's no back. And then on the other side, it's like the kind of books we had when we were kids. And um, I probably spent as much time making sure that that was even than I did writing the book. Cause I just, <laughs> I needed to have good stories and bad stories. It needed to be physically balanced so you could flip the book and it made sense. And you know, nobody's ever said to me, Oh my gosh, I love that book so much. I love the way it was so balanced. But <laughs> in my mind, I know that even if you don't notice it, it's the fact that you don't notice it means that I did it properly. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's one of those things I'm just really meticulous about to the point that it would probably irritate anyone who had to work with me. Um, <laughs> you know, so, so yeah, I just, I think it's important because I think that we do learn from everyone loves a train wreck story. Like everyone loves it. It's just na human nature to love laughing at something or, you know, seeing somebody tweet something insane. Like you, we can't help it, but you know, we all learn from both the negative and the positive. And I think especially for business people who are most of our writers or entrepreneurs or, you know, business owners that you learn from not only the bad, but then how does the bad get handled? And not only the good, but then how does the good get handled? So we try to make sure that all of that is represented. But it is, it is like uh, work, I would say. Yeah, I would say that's work. The yeah. only side of it that's, that's work, everything else is fun, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that is definitely work. Yeah, that's awesome. That's, that's funny to hear that because I, I love that book. And you're right. I, I never thought, gosh, this is balanced well. But now that you say it, like, yeah, no, this is actually like perfection in the way it's done. So well done, Allison. Good. It was a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> um, once a story has been told, like once you've written a book, is the story done? You know, I notice obviously, you know, you have new versions of books, this kind of stuff. How often, so I guess my question isn't necessarily, is it done? Cause we know it's not. How often do you think about going back and changing things or even blog articles, maybe or whatever, once it's been written, shouldn't it be done? Well, it should be, but because of what we write about, and I think for some people, the story is done. Like the, the stories themselves are done. You know, we told that story about what happened to us at that particular restaurant or, we, or this particular, excuse me, CEO who did this. We told that story. The story is done. But because of what we write about, because of innovation, because of things changing in the world, like we wrote on marketing was written in 2008. So if you're online at all, you know, the world has changed a lot since mm -hmm. 2008, like, and, and not only the online world, but just 
are, there was no, in terms of business, no Uber, no Airbnb, like the, there's a lot of, been a lot of changes. So what happened with unmarketing was that, um, when we did the, we did a hardcover first, when we did the paperback, we did some small tweaks to it and some revisions, but that was, I think 2011 or 12. And then we just, you know, so many people read it. They have it on college campuses and people pick it up all the time. Like it's our most, most sold book. And what would happen is that the advice that we'd given for what to do in 2008 wasn't necessarily applicable in 2017. Like that's a big, that's like in internet years, that's like a <laughs> lifetime. So we just, we, we got kind of tired of constantly being like, okay, yes, we did say that, but you know, now we're going to talk like Instagram isn't in on the original on marketing. I mean, there's, just, it's very hard. So when we're going in as Scott's going in to speak at a company looking and they're looking for advice on, you know, relationship marketing and all this stuff, you can't, you can't lead them to a book that is out of date. And we just felt like, even though the lesson of unmarketing is the same and it really is, the stories have changed because the, the ecosystem has changed. So that was what led us to want to do the second edition of unmarketing. And we actually like tagline was everything has changed and nothing is different because we didn't have to change any of the real message of the book. We just sort of, you know, we didn't talk about teleseminars you know, because <laughs> that was silly. And so, yeah, we updated sort of to make it more relevant. You, I think you always want to think when whatever story you're telling, you always want to think about how it's going to be heard on the other side, right? The idea is to create some kind of message that people are going to be able to receive. And we felt like because, because of when we had written it, the message might not get through to people because it could seem so dated. And so that was really why we reframed it was to make sure these are still things that we think are important in business, but you know, we have to update it or it's just not, it loses some of its effectiveness. Yeah. Yeah. So, so again, kind of going back to thinking about your reader, your buyer persona, think about the person taking it in mm-hmm. and what do they need from it? So yeah, that's a yeah, good one. Yeah, absolutely. I like, I like that. What do you think is, is one of your biggest challenges in storytelling in general, or maybe even in writing? Um, I think sometimes I have like a very casual style. Like I like to, I, I think if I was writing about something which I consider to be more serious. <laughs> like I think business is serious and that it's our livelihood and it's important. But like I've certainly written things in the past in school and stuff that were, I was a, I went to university for social work and I wrote papers about much heavier topics and then I could be more serious. But when I'm writing about business, I tend to be very personal and say I and like, you know, I just, I think it should be like listening to me speak it to you in some ways. And I think sometimes that can be a detriment just in terms of, like I just said, like the person on the receiving end, it might seem too casual sometimes to people. Um, but at the same time, I couldn't really write in a different way, nor would I want to. And that very same thing is the thing that some people say that they really like about it. Um, I get quite exhausted when a book is done. (laughs) So I probably have, and I know not all authors are like this, but I really don't write for a couple months after. I don't have like a blog that I have to write for. I don't, I don't write. I know writing is a part of our business, but we don't like write to work if that makes sense. So Mm -hmm. I can take that time because when I'm done, I'm really done. Like I, I done to the point where I don't think I could ever write another book. And then, you know, four months later, five months later, then, you know, it feels like it. So I think some people are better at that, at, you know, keep on writing, keep on writing. And I'm not, I'm really good at like, you know, I can dedicate six months to a book, get it done. And then I like need four months off. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So you mentioned, you know, how fast the world changes and obviously, you know, everything's different, nothing's the same, et cetera. How has all of that changed when it comes to things like media and social media? How has that affected your storytelling personally? Well, that's, you know, so much of what we write about. And also, especially at the beginning, we write, much less about social media now than we did back in 2008, 2009. Cause then we were kind of like on the, on the side where we were trying to convince people like you need to be on social. <laughs> Whereas that's kind of, you know, like a bit of a given now that people know about social. So that has really changed what we write about. And then now we're much more writing about all different kinds of businesses um, as opposed to social media. Like I wouldn't even say on branding on branding isn't about social media, but what we first started writing on marketing at the beginning anyway, it was very much a social media book. That's what we taught people how to do LinkedIn. That was what we wrote about. So that's really evolved for us. Um, The way we use social has changed a bit, but I think Scott and I are both kind of 
not that different than the way we used to, except maybe sometimes we use it a little less maybe than we did back in 2009 and 2008. Um, you know, we still use it to do cool things that we love. We still think it's basically just talking to people and getting to know people, which is very valuable. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, there's certainly, we haven't seen a huge change affect us in terms of, you know, eBooks or audiobooks or all of that kind of stuff. Like to us, it's just the content. It doesn't matter to us how people consume it as long as, you know, they're getting, they're getting it. Right. Um, but yeah, I would say our main focus isn't, is much broader than it used to be. We write about leadership and mm -hmm. consumer advocacy and all this kind of stuff now. So you don't really see like the, the I mean, you, you know, you hear some people say, well, the, the 140 character world has made everybody less effective communicators. They don't write, they don't read, et cetera, et cetera. You don't, you don't I think don't, that? I'm very like, we, one of the things we've been talking about a lot lately in our work is, you know, the whole like millennial, like millennials kill this. <laughs> and this. I don't really buy into that. I, I think that every generation is always down on the generation that comes after them. I think that's just part of getting older and then seeing a bunch of young people. And I think the attitudes younger people have are the same as the attitudes younger people have always had. And we, Scott's been researching and we found some fun things like about super old quotes, like from hundreds of years ago saying how, I can't remember, I think it was chess was going to ruin kids. Like they were playing chess and like they were ru ruining society by having this game that had no work associated with it. Just, they were rotting their minds with chess, you know, which I think is to us is hysterical. And That's we awesome. have kids, we have teenagers and, and a 20 year old and, I don't, they read, like they love books and, and they, they read for fun. They read in school. I don't see, I don't see that happening. I, I guess I get a little irritated when I get a text from my teenager and there's no real words and they're just all like consonants dragged together. But that's, but my mom used to be irritated with me by how, because I didn't answer the phone as formally as I, you know, I just think that every generation kind of sees those things in the ones younger than them. So I don't think no. Twitter's killed anything. I, I still love Twitter. I'm going to be like the last man standing for some reason, but I love, I always go there for news. I go there for events. I love watching an award show with Twitter. Like I'm, you know, I love that. Um, and I think that it's a great way to talk to people. I'm not on there as much as I used to be, but you know, this, this is the world we live in and things are always changing and we have to take, we, we choose what we use. If you don't like Twitter, don't use Twitter. Like, that's cool with me. I don't have a problem with that. Right. So I, I just, I think that's a bit of a cop out sometimes, you know, yeah. I think oh, yeah. I, I understand. I hate to see newspapers suffering and I do, I, I do get that. And I do think that we need, you know, good journalists and all. I totally am behind that. Um, but my kids read and, and, and I think I know a lot of people's kids read. And so I hope that that's really where you hope to see it, right? That kind of connection is, you know, if 16 year olds are still reading for fun, I think we're, Mm -hmm. I think we're probably okay. So yeah, my, yeah. Mine, are, mine are 11 and 12. They both read a ton and write too. Yeah. So yeah. And, and they write well. I, I, I will say that when you said that about the consonants, um, we communicate through emoji and bitmoji a ton. Yeah. I think it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. But I, do you know what I mean? Like sometimes it's just an excuse kind of to yeah. not get to know how a younger generation is doing something. You just kind of oh, like yeah. blame them for, you know, whatever you don't like, but I think it's a cop out. Yeah. So. Um, so Allison, when it comes to uh, storytelling, do you have a muse or inspiration that, that really gets, gets you going? Well, I'm definitely inspired by my kids who are hysterical and, I'm, and I could tell a million stories about them. And that's really when I started writing online was I started a blog for my company that I had before I did marketing. And I wrote a lot of stories about parenting and kids. And so I'm constantly like, always have something that I feel like writing about them. Um, I love consumer advocacy. So a lot of the stories in the book are, you know, stories that we had. And like, as soon as they happened to me, I started writing them down. Like, like I can't believe that this just happened and I'm typing it out. So I'm inspired, inspired by that. And, you know, the partnership where they asked about the co-writing, one of the great things about Scott and I is that he's great at these big ideas. So like he's, you know, there's a story that we like to tell from Unselling, which is our book before this one. Um, where he just like ran downstairs one day and looked at me and said like a term, he said funnel vision. And I wrote three chapters <laughs> and that's how our minds work, right? Like, you know, so I, he inspires me the way he sees things It always inspires me to want to write something about it. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm pretty lucky because I have a lot of different things I like to, I like to write about. Fortunate and blessed, right? Yeah, that's awesome. absolutely. That's cool. <laughs> So, uh, Allison Kramer, author, co-author of Unselling, Unbranding, uh, major storyteller, social media fan, uh, is joining us on Storytellers Network today. And 
And I want to ask you too, what, if you could think of either one of yours that you've put out there or one that you've read, what it would be your favorite story? My favorite story. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I don't know. I'm probably going to have to pick one in the book because I probably have too many favorite stories. Yeah. Um, although we actually, it was funny. So we did, uh, that our podcast got to the episode 200. So we had a live podcast audience come in and we recorded 200 and 201. And uh, in episode 201, we tell this story and um, Scott tells a story about taking a private airplane. I don't know if you listen to it, but he, he's taking a private airplane and he talks about, which I would never do anyway, because I don't like to fly. So there's the first step. And he talks <laughs> about sitting on this private airplane and, um, you know, just he's hysterical. So you have to listen to it. But at the end of the story, he says that there's a lever beside his seat on his airplane seat and he doesn't know what it does. It's not labeled or anything. And he pulls it and it sends his seat out like swiveling around because you can face like if you have a meeting on the plane. And like, so he's telling the story and he, in the story he's landing when he does this. So he does it really physically. It's really hysterical. And I just looked at everybody and I, this wasn't planned. Like I didn't know he was going to tell that story. And I just was like, there are two kinds of people in the world. Like people who pull the lever on the plane that they don't know what it does. And like every other kind of person. <laughs> and that's my favorite story right now. Cause I think that sometimes I like stories like that, that sum up this kind of humanity that we all have i think there's that's one of the beautiful things about stories is that it kind of takes what's happening to you and like lets other people sort of see oh i can get that like i understand that like my kid does that or we do this or and then and then you remember it and it connects you to another person and i think that if you're lucky enough like i am to be able to write stories that might reach like people you don't even know then you get to share that little bit of that experience with them and i think that that's so cool because it crosses over the fact that you're different people you live in different places you you know you do different jobs or whatever that story lets you kind of be like oh i get that like i'd be like that too and so that's been my favorite one lately because we've been getting such great reaction to it that you know everyone's like yeah i'm totally at like i would definitely pull it or like i would never do that so i like that about it, the story it's about that connection and for the record i would pull it so anyway yeah weirdos <laughs> Why do you think humans love stories so much? Whether it's, you know, from oral family histories to bit to learning stories on business, what is it that we love about stories so much? I just think it's such a uniquely human thing to be able to remember. Like it, I think it brings us back. The person who tells the story brings you back and sort of gives you a memory. And then it connects you to other people through that shared experience, which makes us feel like even though we're different, like, hey, we share that experience, whatever it was, and that you understand people a little bit better. Like I, you know, there's a story in the book about us trying to buy a chair from Sears and this frustrating experience that I had with Sears when they were still in business, which now they are not. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I, I could come out and say in a sentence, like, Sears is the worst, they treated me badly. And other people aren't going to connect with that because that's just me getting mad. But when I tell this funny story about how this chair arrived and it was backwards and they told me I was wrong about that, that it wasn't backwards. And then the person was rude and they wouldn't take it back. And then all of a sudden the other person on the end is like, Oh my gosh, I had that happen to me with a piano or a chair or something like, so it, it sort of makes it approachable and, and common in some way that it like creates like a commonality about, about pe between people, I think. And I mean, we start telling stories when we're kids, like we just, it's just a natural human way I think to communicate. And, and I love to tell them because I think that funny things happen to us all over the place. And I just, I, sometimes I, that's me. Like, I just want to tell people that the Sears lady was ridiculous. <laughs> I just, I need to be reassured that it's not me, you know, that, that this is crazy. Uh, so I think people react for that way too. Um, and it's one of my favorite things about social media is that we get to share them so broadly because I care about what happens to my friends. And if, you're a friend of a friend of a friend and I see your story, I care about what happened. And, and that's so cool where you get to kind of like megaphone and widen out your circle and be connected to all kinds of people through these, you know, ways of finding a kind of a thread between all the stories. Yeah. That's great stuff, Allison. How, how are writers in particular supposed to get our stories out there today with all the other noise going on? How does a writer get their story out there? Do you think? Um, well, I think first of all, that I would never let that stop people from writing. I think that, you know, I was at a conference many years ago with my other company, which was a product for new moms. And 
I was, you know, on a panel and I was talking about business and blah, blah, blah. And, and somebody stood up to ask a question and she's like, I want to start a blog. You know, I'm just a mom. And then she kept walk, talking and I'm like, there's no such thing as just a mom. There's no such thing as just a real estate agent or just an author. Like we all are people and we all have something, something, something very unique about us, whatever that may be. And I think we can all learn something from whatever that experience is. Like there's no just, and some of our, some of the best stories are simple love stories or simple struggle stories, or there, it doesn't need to be as unique. It sometimes actually it's not, it's the commonality that makes the story nice to read. Mm -hmm. And in terms of getting it out there for us, we, uh, had social media platforms and that's how we got our stories out. We Wiley came to Scott in 2008 and offered him a book deal. We were very lucky that way, but you know, he put a lot of work into building up that platform and part of its timing and when we started and you know, it's a lot harder to build up Twitter now than it was in 2008. And, but we just started telling them. And, and I think too, you just have to write or speak or video, whatever you're going to, whatever kind of story you want to tell it to the, the best that you can in a way that you're proud. And then I think you need to be proud when you're done. Cause that's one of my big things is like, I, I consider a book a success when the final edit goes to the, goes to Wiley. That's it. I don't, I can't live a life where I only deem it a success if it hits a list or somebody writes this five star review or whatever. Like, I just think writers need to get better at that. Cause there's a lot of pressure now that, you know, why write your story if a million people aren't going to see it? And it's like, no, cause even if one person sees it, it might be the person that is shaped by it. So yeah, I would say just to write it and not to be paralyzed by some need for it to be perfect, but to gain your happiness by the completion, you know, the, by what you can control. And then social media is great for that. You put it out there, friends read it, family reads it. You know, it's not going to start off. I remember putting a blog out and nobody reading it. Like I remember what that felt. It's like shouting into an empty room and only having like echo come back at you. But it just, it takes a little bit of time. And I would also make sure that um, for storytellers as well, for anyone who does like a podcast, for example, like what you're doing or um, social media stuff, if you're not consuming and sharing other people's work, and commenting on other people's work, then you can't possibly expect to grow any kind of platform. Like I have so many people who ask, you know, nobody's replying to me, Twitter's dead, no one's replying to me. And, uh, and I'm like, well, did you go out and reply to anybody? And they're like, no, I didn't, I, like, it's an ecosystem. And so if you wanna be a storyteller and you want people to share your work, I would suggest going out and reading and sharing some other people's work and, and being a part of the community, you know, the bigger conversation. Yeah, that's great. Give, share, just yeah. do it kind of thing. I love that. So just, many people uh, say that. It, it blows my mind. <laughs> yeah. So that's crazy. Did so whether it's your seven listeners to the Un Podcast <laughs> or it's uh, the millions that buy your books, uh, when did you look around and realize that you've made it? Or or do you still not even think that you have? <laughs> no, I think I have, but I think that's about um my definition of making it. You know, I a lot of people ask us like, you know, the what's next question or so what's next, you know, what are you guys going to do next? <laughs> and we just really like, I can plateau for the next 40 years and be happy. Like I have, I get to do what I love to do. I get to also have the freedom of being an entrepreneur and I could be at school at two and you know, I don't have to, that's important to me. I get to work with somebody I love and someone I'd love to work with I, and do what I want. And we have enough for food on the table and a vacation sometimes, you know, I don't really have, um, I don't have bigger dreams than what I've, where I am. So, you know, for me, it's just, I just want to keep doing what we're doing and uh, it's at a level that is very manageable for me and I'm happy with it. And as much as I would love, you know, a zillion people to read the book, if they never do, I was happy when, you know, just one person had read it. I, I feel like I'm very, 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 very lucky. And I'm appreciating that, like in the moment, which is cool. So, yeah, that's, that's cool. when I knew I made it. I think, and I think it was probably like when I realized that, like when I was just like, you know what, I would very happily do what I'm doing for the rest of my life with no complaints and just feel like the luckiest person in the world. And, mm -hmm. You know, and whether that's what I do or what somebody else does, that realization is I has to be making it because I can't imagine anything better than that. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. What a great yeah. outlook. Yeah, I'm lucky. <laughs> yeah. And so to wrap it up, I've got one more question for you. It's the big okay. one. <laughs> oh, no. It's, it's the, the Barbara Walters moment. No. Um, <laughs> if you could tell one last story 
what would it be? It would definitely be a, like a personal story about my kids. Yeah. I just, that's where my heart is. Like I, they got older and now I don't write about them anymore. I throw in little bits. Like I'll put, there's in stuff in the book about them in an anecdotal way. Cause I spent a lot of time with them, <laughs> but, um, you know, they, that is really where my heart lies. And so, and, and it's just, it's endless entertainment. Like, I don't know what I did before I had these people, <laughs> but they're so big now. I try not to, like, I'm very conscious of them as people and adults to be and so I'm very conscious not to share their stories as much as I share my own in response to them if that makes sense yeah. um yeah so I think it would probably be a family story that no one would ever read and it would still be worth writing like you know it's that's something you get to like once you get more successful at something you start feeling pressure to write what people want and I think like you know you have to write this book because that's what's selling right now or you have to focus, do this podcast, because that's what people want to hear according to some other successful podcasts. And I think it's really important to um, not do that, which yeah. is a privilege, of course. But like, if you have the opportunity to not do not work that way, I think it's better to write what you feel like you can write your best at or whatever the best story is, you can tell to tell that rather than people love stories about butterflies. So let's write a story about a butterfly, you know? <laughs> exactly. So, so great inspirational talk, amazing points. Where can people find you, Allison, personally, mm -hmm. but also as the co-author and on marketing and everything? Where's, where can we find you? Um, well, on marketing has a great Facebook page where I spend lots of time. So you can always reach us there. And I'm on Allison on Twitter. And uh, you can watch the Unpodcast if you want to. They come out once a week pretty fun to listen to. Great when you're on the treadmill. Good stuff. <laughs> um, yeah. And on branding, if you go to marketing.com, all the links for the books or whatever one you want to read is there. We're very around and chatty. So if you have questions or feedback, we're always happy to hear it. And yeah, we're not hard to find. So. Yeah, I completely agree. You guys have been <laughs> amazing to be connected to just me personally. I'm, I'm, I'm just a marketer. So, uh, just, eh? <laughs> so I appreciate your time today, Allison. Thank you so much for making time for our listeners here on the Storytellers Network. Thank you. I enjoyed it. All right. So there you go. Thank you so much, Allison Kramer, for joining us. Be sure to visit her online, as you heard, on marketing.com, the Unmarketing Facebook uh, page, the Unpodcast. Check her out everywhere she is. You can find links to all that in our show notes. And if you enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing it all over the place. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Snapchat. I don't care. Email it out there. Text it to somebody. Anywhere that you can share with storytellers is always helpful. So we appreciate it. And please consider leaving us a review. Uh, to our partners at Casterly and Podcast Pilot, thank you. Thank you for making the world of podcasts a better place. Jamie J and Sarah Parrish and the rest of the team over there at Podcast Pilot and Casterly, terrific humans, and you'll be better off knowing them. Without their support, the Storytellers Network would be just a dream. And also without the support of, again, my parents, Dick and Sharon Moyle, thanks for helping take care of these, uh, these first episodes of the inaugural season of the Storytellers Podcast. So until next time, here's to telling our stories and having stories to actually tell. Cheers. Cheers.